good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I will talk about uh, some machine learning paradigms which could be used for thermal power plants. So I will like to confess up front that I don't know much about the operation of thermal power plant, rather I don't know. But uh, you know, um, I know a little bit about AI and machine learning. So I will talk about some potential of this thing. So before I start, I'd like to just know a little bit about your background. How many of you have a background of basic machine learning or artificial intelligence? If you could raise your hand. Okay, not everybody. And uh, how many of you have some background on thermal power plants? Everybody. So good, you know, we have complimentary um, this thing, but you know, this will be a very basic talk. So all of us know, I'll keep this brief, that AI uh, is a system for building intelligent agents. And today we see that AI is used in every sphere of activity because we want to augment what uh, we are capable of doing to increase our efficiency and to be able to do things more efficiently than we can do. And uh, because of this, AI has been ubiquitous in every field. And especially, uh, today we will talk about machine learning, which is the ability to learn from data. So typical process is that you have some uh, you know, data from which you learn and you get a model. And that model is used for inferencing and reasoning. Very simplistic view, but we'll just start with that. Now, in a power plant, again, you know, please pardon me for my lack of uh, knowledge about power plants sufficiently, but in general, in any manufacturing plant or power plant or chemical plant, where can machine learning or AI make a difference? We want higher quality output. Maybe that's not so much relevant, uh, maybe, to a power plant, but definitely you want increased efficiency, you want to reduce cost, and you need to uh, you know, uh, stick to the norms, whether it's of emission control, reduce wastage, and so on. So these are some of the you know, places uh, where uh, you know, AI can be used. And these are some examples uh, which one can think of, possibly. For example, the input, you know, one has to look at what type of input uh, to do uh, to achieve, uh, you know, efficient operation and cleaner combustion. Then how to do process control or optimize the process by, by deciding what set points for the process parameters to use so that the power plant can, or any plant, can work efficiently. Um, and, you know, uh, you know last, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Ashish, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Rajiv Das, and many people talked about uh, different uh, requirements that one has. And for that, one has to optimize the process parameters to meet the demand requirements or many other norms. Then you need to do emission reduction and of course, we had a, a talk on demand forecasting and management of energy for which uh, this uh, sort of technology is used. And in the morning, many people have talked about predictive maintenance uh, in order to detect um, you know, when uh, you should have some uh, component for maintenance. And then industrial safety. So in an industrial environment, uh, to see that there are no Mm, you know, uh, you know, to inspect autonomously, especially in hard to access places, and to detect early that something is going to fail, or you know, there's some uh, accident may, might might not happen, etc. Then autonomous inspection using image recognition. These are you know some of the few you a know, few of those areas where uh, machine learning and AI can be directly used in a thermal power plant, and there are many more. Things. You know, this is just a model in my, you know, of a possibly a data driven plant operation overall. So there's a plant, the typical path is the yellow path, 
where you have the observation experience of the operators and human decision making on the other hand if you have data driven plant operation you would have sensors which will collect the data historically a lot of data in the different conditions and have an ai ml system which analyzes data and try to take a decision of course that's the full uh, automatic path but what people try to do and uh, you know some speakers have mentioned about it try to build a model of the plant or any component that you are going to model what is called uh, today very popularly as digital twin so that based on the data you can build a twin of the system on which you can uh, try to uh, you know see how it will work under different conditions and do different types of analysis now if you talk about these different applications they are fueled by data and today you know everywhere in every industry in every walk of life i mean even in our personal lives all everybody wants to collect data and everybody wants to get benefit from data and definitely in any plant data is extremely useful to be able to use the data to build intelligent systems and this has been facilitated by the rise of iot and different types of sensors and capture the different types of data both structured data in terms of the different models the param different parameters etc and also unstructured data like images video text etc and utilize them for machine learning now this is a very you know basic machine learning uh, model uh, flow you have data and then given a task at hand you identify features which are relevant for that task so extract the features or identify features from experts and build models on those features now so the data once you understand what is important about the data so you can extract those features or you can try to get derived features from those features and the feature choice will depend on initially may depend on the understanding of the experts in that domain so they can be structured as well as unstructured and use relevant features uh, i may make some mistakes or you know a lot of mistakes in talking about um, power plants but probably in according to some literature which i quickly studied these could be in some tasks of a power plant relevant to a power plant you can think of these as features like coal flow rate steam flow steam temperature main steam temperature reheat steam temperature steam inlet pressure exhaust temperature composition of exhaust boiler temperature and so on so depending on the process that you are trying to model you have to identify what features are relevant and then you have to acquire those features and as we saw that we can use iot's and sensors to collect the data sometimes you know this is uh, one thing that you know one of my uh, colleagues uh, we have been talking about at some point is that sometimes uh, it may not be possible it may be too costly to deploy very precise sensors which can collect uh, you know very good features very good quality features but one can also have a lot of low quality sensors which are cheaper and even try to get whatever data one can have as i said you can image text you know uh, any type of sensor so that you have a lot of data and try to get value from that data some of the processes for example the operation of the plant as we saw is also a sequential process so it's not just at a point you decide some input or in some parameters and you get the output at the end of the story it's a sequential process and uh, one has to the data that one has to collect should be the time series data and also in the operation of the plant it's also a sequential process and one has to look at machine learning paradigms which can continuously control the system so this is the first part is the feature extraction then depending on the task one has to choose a model 
and the type of the model one chooses will depend on the nature of the task. So in the power plant, it's not just the task of you know having the plant operation. There are many, many different types of tasks, like inspection of something, and so, so many types of tasks. And depending on the nature of the task, one will choose some model. Some examples of basic machine learning models are like linear regression or decision tree, different types of graphical models, neural networks, deep neural networks, and so on. Now, with this basic background, I will talk about the basic machine learning paradigms in general. And uh, possibly, you can uh, suggest or you can think of what type of uh, task relevant to a power plant. The power plant they can be used for. So the basic type, one basic type of machine learning paradigm is the supervised learning paradigm. In the basic case, what you have is you have different instances. And for each instance, you have the input feature, so the input parameters and the output. And you collect data about that. This is called label data. And then you build a model so that given the input, the model can predict the output. Okay, for example, you know, suppose you are doing demand forecasting. So, you know, uh, the previous speaker talked about some of the parameters which uh, dictate what is the demand, whether it is the time of the day or the season or, you know, other things, weekday, etc. Uh, temperature, humidity, whatever is the parameters required. So you can take the, collect the parameters and you can have data about different uh, time uh, slots. And you know that historically, uh, you know, these, that was the demand in those days. And from that, you can build a model. Then we have unsupervised learning, where you have a lot of data, but you do not have any labels. So this is called unsupervised learning. And there are different uh, types of unsupervised learning. One common type of unsupervised learning is called clustering. And there are other types of unsupervised learning, which try to form the model of the data. Then the third paradigm, which is also very useful, is the paradigm of reinforcement learning, which is especially useful when you have a continuous system. So you have the, uh, you know, you have an interaction, the system interacting with the environment continuously. And it's not just at a point you decide what are the, what is the output, but you have to take sequential action to decide the optimum policy. And we'll talk a little bit about these models um, um, now. So there's also semi-supervised learning where you have some labeled data and a lot of unlabeled data. Now, uh, so in supervised learning, which is the very basic form of machine learning, basic paradigm of machine learning, what you have is training data in forms of features, for instances where your features and the output for every instance. And you have to predict, find a function f, which given any xi can predict yi. Okay. So, you know, I went through some of the few recent uh, papers in this domain. So I just not talk about the full details about it, but uh, this is one task uh, that we came across. So which is modeling the power production. So you want to know that given these inputs, how much power will be produced. So this is a very simple example, very standard example uh, of machine learning, which can be applied to a power plant. So the features that they use is cold flow rate, main steam flow, main steam temperature, reheat steam temperature, etc. So these are the some of the features which dictate what is the production of power. And in this particular work, uh, they have used uh, some machine learning methods, like one machine learning method is a support vector machine. And then uh, one type of deep learning using an extreme learning machine and a statistical methodology called response surface methodology. They have used this different machine learning methods and they have applied on this task. And then they have seen that when they take data 
and they use a machine learning model. Machine learning model is a little complex. I'm not going into the details, but the basic machine learning model is this. And they are able to demonstrate that there are certain key performance indices relevant to this uh, power production task. And they're able to show that with respect to these performance indices, such as fuel flow rate, thermal efficiency, power plant heat rate, and the emission discharge. They are able to show that by building this model and using this model, they're able to improve on these uh, tasks. So this is just that this is a demonstration that, uh, you know, so they had a particular task, which is efficient power generation with some net zero goal. And you know, they also look at not only the production, but also the regulations about these emissions, et cetera. And they're able to demonstrate that by using this machine learning model, they're able to get better efficiency. The second paradigm as, you know, so there are other examples of supervised learning. For example, there are a lot of people, a lot of, you know, tasks in um, manufacturing plants, I'm sure in power plants, there's a lot of case of using object recognition. So there are, so suppose, you know, again, I'm, I do not know much about the plant, but you know, there are different components. You want to understand whether a component is in the right state or not, or, you know, if there are different states of a particular object. So people often use computer vision as a classification task to detect the state of an object or detect the presence of objects. So these are all supervised classification tasks. Then let's look at an example of unsupervised learning or clustering. So what is clustering? Clustering is one form of unsupervised learning. It's a form where one takes data which is not labeled and tries to find patterns in the data and find the main groups in the data. So group similar objects. And you can think of one application of uh, clustering uh, for anomaly detection. Suppose you have different, uh, you have a lot of data of the normal operation of a plant. And then you apply clustering to group the find the different patterns. And you want to understand when there is some problem, right? And the main problem with understanding this is that the failure cases are very limited. So people who want to do, you know, predictive maintenance, et cetera, the typical problem that they come across is that there are very few examples of failure cases, a lot of examples of normal cases. This is where unsupervised learning is very useful because if you take the normal cases and build a normal model, or in, in the case that there is, you know, there are different scenarios, you can find the major clusters or groups. Then if you find that your current data is not falling into any of these clusters, it means this is an anomalous data, or this is perhaps some problem is going to happen. So you can flag. So unsupervised methods are very useful for abnormality detection and to understand probably something is wrong. Probably this system is looking different or behaving differently than what normally does. And for that, uh, you know, this paradigm of unsupervised learning is very useful. So, as I said, anomaly detection using clustering, where you can look at the normal samples and characterize them in some way, either by clusters or by building a model. There are different unsupervised methods using normal machine learning or deep learning to build a model. Nowadays, there are lots of autoencoders and different you know, generative models, which can take the data and build models. And then you can find out if your data deviates from the model. So I saw found this paper, uh, which talks about anomaly detection of power plant equipment using LSTM based autoencoder neural networks. And uh, what they have done is that they look at the time series data of the power plant operation. And based on this, they construct a normal model. And they use an LSTM autoencoder to try to find out whether the current uh, you know, data deviates from this normal model to find the anomaly. So this is a very important use case. The last type of paradigm I'll talk about today 
is the reinforcement learning paradigm. So reinforcement learning, you have the agent or your system which is interacting with the environment continuously. So the, at a particular time, the agent takes an action on the, and then you get you know, the output from that action. You get through your sensors and you take the next action. So it's not just one uh, sort of parameters that you have to choose, but you have to continually interact with the environment. And in a plant, this is what happens. Okay. And so agent take action with the system takes action which impacts the environment. And based on this, you perceive through your sensors how the environment is reacting. And based on your objectives, you also set up your cost function or reward function. So what is it that, you know, whether it's a production or emission. So based on that, you set your rewards or penalties to decide how good they are. And the system works over a time. So this is the paradigm of reinforcement learning. And I saw a very nice paper, which was published in AAAI, which is one of the premier AI conferences last year, which used reinforcement learning on the production of a thermal power pl plant uh, deployed in uh, some uh, large power plants in China. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So in this work, what these people have done is that they have taken up the task of optimization of the combustion efficiency of a thermal power generating unit, which they call a PPGU. And they want to optimize this. And these are the steps that they have done. So they have collected that data. Now the data, the problem with data collection is that you only get data about you know, what has happened. So the data typically may not contain all possible scenarios, right? And it is difficult, you know, typical reinforcement learning, there are ways where you can experiment with the system so that you can get more data of all types of scenarios and build a model. But that's not always possible because you don't want to deviate the process by which the power plant is working. So what they have done is that they have built a simulator which will give more data. So they have got some actual data. Using that data, they have built a simulator of the system. I mean, sort of digital twin of the system and use that to get more data. Now, the problem is that this simulator works on only the type of data that you have given. Now, if you use it on out of distribution data, you know, you do not know how much you can trust the output. So, you know, they have considered that in the later operation. But basic idea is that they have got some uh, historical data for the offline data. And then they have used a simulator built on that data to collect more data. And using this data, they have uh, combined data. They have trained a reinforcement learning model to decide how to control the power plant. So I found this total uh, system uh, very interesting. So you know, I have limited understanding of the different components of the power plant. But if you, uh, if you uh, permit, I'll talk a little bit about the portion that I understood. So uh, what they say that the TPG, you know, because you know you people are experts, I'm not. But in this paper, they say that their TPGU has these three major stages: the coal pulverizing stage, the burning stage, and the steam circulation stage. And in order to build the model, both for the simulator and for building the controls, they have considered all these different stages and what are the different control parameters and the requirements of each stage. And they have identified what are the important constraints and what are the important controlling parameters. For example, for the coal pulverizing stage, uh, they say that the amount of coal should meet the demand load. Then the valves of the cold and hot air blowers have to be adjusted to ensure suitable primary air temperature. These are some constraints. For the burning stage, they say that the, the valves at each of the injection, injection location, the 20 to 48 locations, they need to be controlled precisely. And then there are safety and regulatory issues that need to be guaranteed. 
so that you have this um, pollution norms, negative internal pressure, they have to be maintained. For the steam circulation stage, they said that the steam generated needs to satisfy multiple temperature and pressure requirements, which are controlled by the uh, valves, etc. So whatever it is, so in a typical plant, there are a lot of different uh, you know, components and they have their behavior and they have, you know, what are need to be done. This is only partly, you know, part of what is reported in the paper. There are several other things. So there are many such number of control parameters. So what they have said is that in their work, they look at about 7,200 major continuous control variables and the chemical properties of the coal, that is the input materials. Now, I'll take a digression. I'll just. I'll talk about the very basics of reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, uh, so then the basic form, we assume that the underlying model of the system is a Markov decision process, where at a particular point, there is a state. And when you take an action, the system changes state in a stochastic, in a manner which is stochastic, but which is Markovian. That is the next state uh, is not fixed, is not, not necessarily fixed, not deterministic. It may be stochastic, but it only depends on the current state and the action. So, and the you receive a reward for example if there's more production there's more reward if there is you know more pollution pollutants produced then there is penalty so so the reward and penalty are there policy is how the system is behaving when you are controlling the system what are your control actions so you are trying to understand that each state what is the action that you should take that is the policy that is what you want to learn and your objective is given by a value function. Value function combines the reward and penalty that you get into a function which you want to optimize. And the policy that you have to decide is that action at every state so that this value function is optimized. So for this, the model, underlying model is taken to be a Markov decision process, which has states, actions, rewards, transitions, and value function. And the way you construct the value function, there are different ways. One of the most popular type of value function is the uh, discounted sum. So R0, R1, R2 are the rewards slash penalties at different time steps. And they are added by taking a discounted sum. So the reward now is not discounted. The reward next time step is discounted by gamma, next time step by gamma square, where gamma is a number between zero and one. So this is, a, this, this is your utility function, which you want to maximize. And the value of a policy at a state is the expected utility. Why expected? Because the system is stochastic. Uh, you know, you don't get exactly the same output when you give the same input but it behaves in a stochastic manner. So you want to do the expected utility. Now, there are various reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, one of the offline, the, you know, what they use is offline reinforcement learning. What is that? They first, based on the data that they have, offline data, fixed data, then you learn a model. Basically, the model is an MDP. You learn the parameters of the MDP. What are the parameters? You know the states, you know the actions. You have to learn the transition function. That in this state, in the, if you take this action, what is the probability distribution of the next state? You also want to understand the rewards. In this state, this action will give you this reward. So based on the data, you learn the MDP. And then once you have the Markov decision process, there are some standard algorithms using dynamic programming where you can find the optimum policy of an MDP so that at every state you can maximize the value function. And for that, there are uh, you know, two uh, standard algorithms like policy iteration, value iteration, etc. And uh, we'll talk about this later. Now, for an TPGU that we talked about, the state that they have taken 
is the chemical property of the coal and sensor data, including temperature, pressure, wind, water, volume, etc. So this is the state they have taken. The actions are the key control variables that impact the combustion process. We talked about that. They have taken 7,200 different control variables. And the reward function is a potent combination of combustion efficiency and reduction in NOx emission. And the cost function, they have safety constraints, etc., which are the regulatory norms. Now, based on this, as I have told, they have first, in order to augment the data, they have built a simulator. Even to build the simulator, they have used a data-driven machine learning approach. Okay? Again, I'm not going into the details, but they do an approximated dynamic model to generate future states. And in order to build the simulator, they do not build one monolithic simulator. Rather, for these three different stages, you know, they have used different machine learning models based on the parameters, etc., and using an RNN, LSTM, fully connected network, different types of neural network. They have built the simulator, which is faithful to the data that they already have. But as I said, they may not, the guarant not guaranteed to work well on the out of distribution data. Now, once they have built the simulator, so that's why this is called an imperfect simulator. And they have also, uh, you know, to build a reinforcement learning system, they have a, they, in, they have a cost critic because they have to, uh, you know, abide by different regulatory norms. So the cost critic to enforce the safety constraints, et cetera. And also they take into account the risk of the simulator. Because when the simulator works on out of distribution data, you cannot trust it fully. So they quantify, they also model the risk. And based on that, they have built a reinforcement learning model, which can decide the control actions of all the 7,200 control variables. And they demonstrate in this paper that they have used this control on four different large thermal power plants in China, and they have quantified the improvements that they have got. In most cases, they have got a reasonable amount of good amount of improvements by using this process. So this shows that you know, in the power plant, they, they have been demonstrated that the use of machine learning uh, has a lot of, you know, people have used it and they have found a lot of benefits and there are a lot of potential of using further systems. With this, I will stop. Uh, thank you.